I would like to start with an introduction to yourself, but I think a better introduction would be for you to introduce the how and the why of your book, The Curveball. Yeah, sure, of course. So um, I'm, I went to law school. I graduated from law school. I graduated in 2018. I decided to write The Curveball because you know I went through some personal adversity in my own life. And I love baseball, which is a sport so popular in Mexico, Latin America, South America, Central America. And I wanted to find a way to combine the lessons I learned from my adversity with sports and with baseball in particular. I mean, I didn't know that COVID would become the curveball. It would be the curveball of curveballs, but um, I wanted to find a way to do that. And it was inspired by my own personal journey and the lessons I learned and the people I was influenced by. And so what was, well, this was like the original inspiration for the book, right? And what was, what were some other influences you have? Well, I mean, pretty much all of it is, is documented like in, in the book from my, my personal journey. Uh, I was obviously when I was writing the book, I had many other inspirations. So, you know, my father being a very uh, particular one in terms of, you know, doing work that has a wonderful quality to it. Um, in terms of getting that inspiration out, getting your words onto the page and perfecting it, the craft, so to speak. But the inspiration to come up with the idea and you know the method and the characterization, that was all very much my own. The other, another thing was I was influenced by the people I was around and the settings I was around. So a lot of them were, were formative people that when I was uh, in my own personal adversity, I was around them and they really helped me kind of get to the next level um, and gave me a great roadmap of skills that I uh, took, you know, in law school, after law school, and especially publishing this book. And so in the book, we get, well, we learn the story of Bryce, who is a baseball player, and he's going through some adversity, right? And so I would like you to talk a little bit about the book so that people listening who haven't read it yet can get interested in it and also get uh, general background. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, we find Bryce, he's a struggling baseball player. He's a struggling individual. Um, and why, while people might not like, this isn't a baseball book per se, baseball is a book to shape the message, but it's really a life book. It's a book full with inspirational wisdom. And, you know, as you clearly articulated about, you know, inspirational fiction and self-help. So that is, the core thematic elements of the book. In terms of the content, you know, we meet Bryce. He's on the downhill trend in his career right now. He's struggling and he's lost. Um, and he meets this individual that takes him through lessons he learned in his past glory days and that would propel him for an even greater future. Yeah, and then this other guy has, well, four rules uh, for to face adversity right and well which are those rules so the four are uh one base at a time so really what that is trying to get at is you know once we're faced in this moment of adversity you know whether it's covid or whether it's some other form of adversity instead of having a big insurmountable challenge we're like oh my god uh we have to take it one base at a time what is the next best actionable step we can take to ultimately get us to where we need to go. Um, and, you know, alone, we alone can choose how we feel, how we react, and ultimately how we act uh, given the sur surrounding circumstances. Okay, and then we have this other rule. Actually, yeah, so, yeah the other one is, is choose your pitches. So really mm -hmm. what that means is like, you know, swing in your circle of, of competence, you know, when he meets another mentor in the book, it's about, he's in part with him, like, you know, you can choose fear, you can choose hope, you can choose fear, you can choose gratitude, but you can't do them all at once. You have to choose the one that fits the present moment. You know, I mean, so often we are the man in the arena to use the Teddy, the Teddy Roosevelt quote, but we alone can choose how we respond to that. You know, what, what rituals we take in. So that is the third uh, 
kind of cardinal rule, which is remembering your rituals. And I think why that is so important is because, you know, they don't need to be grandiose rituals. They can be very simple rituals, whether it's dinner with family, whether it's getting on the phone with a coach, whether it's talking with friends, but we alone can choose them when we are struggling, when we're stuck. And it is a way of getting out our higher performance, our higher potential and saying to ourselves, we are about to do what we've always known we could do. And it's a way to reprogram that. And we only learn that once we're stuck in, in that moment. I'd say the final thing is, is um, you know, adversity is a team sport, right? You know, that is true, not only in sports, but it's true whenever the challenges arise, whether when the stakes are incrementally going up, it is a team sport. We're not alone, although we might feel that way, but there's so many, you know, people we can call on, you know, uh, experiences we've all had in our formative years uh, that we can really bring out in, in those times. Yeah. And about the second rule. So what you say in the book is that you have to choose how you respond to adversity, right? I, either you are proactive or not. But yes. I wonder, do you think choosing your pitches is also about choosing which adversity to face? Well, I think once we're faced in that moment, I mean, we can do the flight response, or we can do the flight response. So yes, we need to look at what adversity, what the particular adversity is calling for, and then we need to choose the correct response to face that, correct, yeah. Okay, yeah, and because for example, in cases like COVID, you don't have any other option, right? But in maybe some personal cases, like either I know, uh, undertaking a project or not doing it, you can face the adversity of, yeah, well, of the project or the adversity of maybe judgment and regret, right? Well, I mean, COVID is, is adversity writ large because we're <laughs> surrounded in this present moment. It's all encompassing. It pervades every aspect of our daily lives currently. So that is the best adversity we can find to really take us to the next level within ourselves. Because that teaches us, you know, and that's where we can do these lessons. If COVID has forced you to lose a job, what are the next smallest things we can take to get to that next level? So whether it's retooling a resume in a very practical way, whether it's a job coach, some other form of adversity that would really propel us in that moment. Yeah, interesting. And how do you apply these rules into your personal life? Do you apply them when necessary or do you look for opportunities to apply them? It, it's, oppor it's opportunities and it's also something that I've been doing for a long time. So when I had my personal adversity, it was all about, you know, going from one step to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And that has taken me from that point uh, to law school and beyond. It's also something that, you know, I, I reflect very, I reflect back on those times as a means to get, bring out my own best performance. So when I'm preparing for like, whatever it is, the future, I look at those times as a way to bring me back and kind of regain what I need to do going forward. Okay. And what is the key lesson you would expect or hope any reader who reads your book gets? So I'd say, you know, um, sometimes we might have to lose something to find everything. And that is powerful because I'm not saying you need to lose everything in a, in a very physical sense. But, you know, if you've been knocked down a notch or a peg or something hasn't gone right, that is okay. That is a great place to begin. I'd say the second thing is, You know, adversity really is a team sport. And I'd say the final thing, you know, from the book is you don't succeed um, in spite of adversity. Yeah. You succeed because of it. I like that quote. And, well, yeah, I was asking this because, you know, 
this year I so I set my uh, to be read uh, goal, but I think it is more important like to apply, and so that was why I am curious about how how to apply the lessons in the book. And yeah, I think that uh, that part of succeeding because of adversity and because of failure is also an important part. For sure, and I'd, I'd love to share another um, yeah, sure. lesson that the readers would take from page 43 of the book, of the curveball, and that is adversity loves your ego. What I mean by that is adversity loves the part of you that is caught up in the grandiose, chasing outward perfection at the expense of inner reflection. So it loves that part that refuses to grow, refuses to regrow, to re-engage. And that's, we don't want to be stuck in, a, in that moment when it comes by with a two by four. Mm -hmm. And well, now returning a bit to what we were chatting about some moments ago, in the book, uh, Bryce discovers what he's meant to do after all this adversity, right? And I'm not actually saying what he does to not spoil the book. Um, what is that part inspired by what you were talking about, uh, about succeeding because of adversity? Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, a lot of those key lessons uh, are based on my own personal experiences when I had my own personal challenge. So, you know, I'm a big believer uh, in the quote, and I think Plato said it well. And he said, you know, uh, everyone is facing a battle we everyone knows nothing about. So those are very personal moments that I chose and I, I put it together in fiction form. And because I think, you know, what is most personal is ultimately what's most universal as well. And if you are going through it, countless other people are going through it as well. Yeah, I agree. And well, uh, here I want to talk about another thing, but uh, so Robin, as your father, has had a big influence in you, right? And what has been the biggest lesson you learned from him? I can write a whole essay on that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a whole book. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say, you know, be someone that, like, just gives impact wherever you can. So the desire of just giving impact... Uh, not chasing, you know, fame for fame's sake, um, just being impact driven uh, and being someone that, you know, cho chooses a very original path that is not afraid to go off the beaten track, so to speak, in, you know, um, law and law, you know, uh, I'm a law graduate, you know, my dad was a lawyer, but, you know, choosing a different path that is ultimately aligned to your passion. That, that is, those are some of the key lessons I've heard. Yeah, that's a great lesson. And what does impact mean to you? Because I, I take it as serving or what's your opinion there? Yeah, it's serving and it's also helping people that you see yourself in and mm -hmm. wanting a better future and a better life for them. Whatever they may choose to do, but you can feel good knowing that you've helped them kind of be on that path, be on that way. And do you think that is the reason why maybe personal stuff is the most relatable? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. if, you don't, if you don't have that personal touch, that personal background, it doesn't have to be anything gigantic. It can be the simplest of things. But that helps build trust. That helps build empathy. And that helps build, you know, um, a great circle around you that people can say, this guy truly knows what it's like when I, where I came from or anyone who truly wants to help me out. Mm -hmm. And that's also the power of fiction, right? Relating yes. to a certain Absolutely. character. Absolutely. I like it. I've always been a, a big fan of, of fiction. I love uh, Jonathan Livingston Siegel. One of, one of the favorite quotes from that book is, um, he's talking about a seagull that wants to transcend the flock. And I just love that you know, metaphor with, with life and, and transcending your limits. And well, now I would like to know what are some of your book recommendations besides from this one? Jonathan Livingston Siegel, uh, my favorite fiction recommendations, a lot of the classics. If you haven't read the classics, you know, Mark Twain, Oliver Twist, um, 
I love the Hardy Boys when I was young for the mystery, uh, the detective stories. Um, uh, Harry Potter, big one. Um, I think it's pretty much that's it. Okay. Yeah, I think I should read more fiction. <laughs> yeah, because I, I think the only fiction books I have like intentionally read are your book and the 5 a.m. Club. <laughs> yeah. Well, and another book I'd like to add is uh, The Little Prince. Yeah. Yeah. Le, Le Prince Plus. Yeah, I, I listened to that one, and that one's pretty good. And now I would like to know what was like your maybe biggest lesson in the process of writing the book? Sure, sure. In terms of the process of writing the book is getting the idea onto page. That is the hardest part. You know, <laughs> you're getting, you're putting your thoughts, however, you know, jumbled up they may be onto the page. And the other part is, is editing it. I know really going through and editing it and editing it and re-editing it. I think the other process that, you know, people would find very valuable is the importance of having a beta group of beta readers that will take your book and give you unbiased feedback on the book. I, you know, I was very lucky to have about seven beta readers that gave me feedback on it. So I was just reincorporating it, editing it, re-editing it. Okay. And now I'm curious, well, you published your book on Amazon, right? Yeah. And where was this? October uh, 13th. And why did you decide to, to, to publish it independently on Amazon? Well, Amazon's the best uh, resource by far for uh, self-published authors. They have a great distribution platform and they really take care of the process in a seamless way. So all you do is you upload your cover and your manuscript and they just take care of binding, packaging to look like this. Yeah. And what are some of your, your plans for in the future? Besides from the career pool and maybe also in the writing world? Well, I love to travel. I really, really love to travel. So when COVID kind of breaks and disappears, I'd love to go to Mexico. Um, <laughs> I love to travel. I love to be around friends, try great food. Um, I, you see also, I, I see great value in, in continuing with the curveball, you know, just spreading the message just as far and as wide as I can. Um, I, I truly believe that, you know, this book can be one of the books of this present moment of this curveball COVID moment that, yeah. You know, anyone of any age can get great meaning and you can get great value from whether you're you know young whether you're uh, you know, middle age it, it's a really it's a truly it's a book for everyone and it's very easy to read mm -hmm. very easy to read yeah actually i think i i read like in four days and again yeah. this story was it was just a page turning book it was a really enjoyable read And also, again, a uh, very relatable read. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, And, wanted, yeah. I wanted to do something different with how the message was shaped. So if you look in the book, a lot of it is going to the past. And, you know, he's mm -hmm. remembering from the past lessons. I think that's a cool way to shape uh, certainly a, the thematic message in the book and how the story kind of ebbs and how it kind of flows. And also in the story you mentioned some characters which I think might have been famous in the baseball world. So yeah. did yeah. you do some research for this or was it just from your personal experience and in being a fan of baseball? Yeah, it was. I did a bit of research because I wanted to get sort of the, the, the time periods right But I've, all, I've been a lifelong fan of baseball. I love the sport. I played the sport. So I, I kind of knew what the field looked like, what the sounds would be like. And I just recall from memory, you know, to put it in the book. Where did this love for baseball came from? Uh, I, I, you know, I'm very athletic. So uh, baseball, soccer, um, I, mm. I love all those sports. So... Yeah, I, I don't skate, which is interesting being from Canada, but, you know, I love those sports. 
And well, is there another book you're planning to write in the future? So I have some thoughts right now, but right now I'm just focused on, you know, promoting this book, spreading the message of this book uh, as far and as wide as I can. Okay. And uh, I asked you what was your biggest lesson uh, in the process of writing the book, but what do you think is the biggest lesson for you from the book or the biggest lesson you wrote into the book from your experiences? From all the main four, mm -hmm. which is like the, the biggest? I'd say the, the lesson on daily perseverance. You know, we've all had times where, you know, it's been hard where, you know, whether it's at a school or at a, at a job to keep going on the little path, the step-by-step -step incrementalism. It, on one hand, I used to find it kind of challenging, but then as I kind of grew, grew older, I kind of embraced it for what it really was. And it's one thing I thought would be very valuable to put in the book. I'd say another thing would be, you know, remembering your rituals, as simple as that sounds. Remembering mm -hmm. what makes you, you know, true to yourself, remembering what makes you uh, super passionate about what is like whatever you choose to do. Uh, and, and once you have those two things, uh, I think it can be pretty cool. Okay. Yeah, and thanks for that clarification because um, what happened to me was that when I read about remembering your rituals is that I thought about, um, you know, having like specific steps to face something. Like, for example, mm -hmm. I don't know if I will have an exam, how do I start here or something? But it, I, I think it is more about um, knowing yourself, right? Or yeah. what, what do you mean there? It's remembering your rituals. It's remembering, you know, a ritual is something you know, that you do. It could be a daily practice. It could be a daily habit. But once you remember that, whether well, it could be the smallest of things, but you just need to remember that. You need to really, you know, delve deep into that. Because that, you know, if you've been doing that for a long time, chances are that means something very deep to you, very powerful to you. Because if you've been doing it for a long time. It also forms your identity. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I like it. Oh, and well, now I'm curious, what has been something you have recently learned or discovered that you would like to share to us? Business to business, like sales, how to really um, do cold call scripts in a, in a pretty fun way. Hmm. Could you get deeper into that? Because, you know, like, I mean, in terms of like sales wise, like, selling, uh, cold calling, you know, uh, people might not be proficient with like cold calling, but how to cold call businesses or individuals and really get a great response out of it. And how do you do that? <laughs> well, I'm just learning right now. So that's, but that's one thing that I found I'm just learning at the moment because I always like to just keep, keep being refreshed of things. And it's one thing I just uh, found out. Found out. Okay. And well, we talked about fiction books, but what are some non-fiction books you would suggest? For sure. So I love, I love you know, personal development books. Mm -hmm. I love personal finance books. Um, I love the 5 a.m. I love The Intelligent Investor. I love uh, Perennial Seller by, by Ryan Holiday. And that's a great book on, on marketing, on getting your brand And I love how he frames the message between um, a, a perennial seller and, and kind of a bestseller. And what is the real difference of a perennial seller? I think that was pretty, pretty fascinating to read. I'd say you asked me, you know, lessons when you're writing a book or coming up with the idea of a book. I'd say, you know, you need to read books like that because I've been blessed and grateful to have read um, that book on writing by Stephen King, um, Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott. So those are books that I've read and I've, I've tried my best to sample uh, ideas from them. Okay. Well, thanks for those recommendations. And cool. I think we are running out of time, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I would like to know, and this is something I asked some of my guests, what would be your advice for your teen self? 
in my teen self. Keep doing the next right thing. Simple okay. as that sounds, just keep doing the next right thing. Yeah. Don't get too caught up in, in ego. Don't get too caught up in, in like the flashy things. Just keep doing the simple things, just the next right thing. Right. Cool. And well, uh, is there anything else you would like to add before wrapping up? Uh, no, I think, I think that's, that's been pretty, pretty comprehensive. Yeah. Yeah, actually a pretty good overview on your book. And I hope people listening to this, uh, get interested in buying your book and learning more about you. Sure. So, uh, for, for your audience, if they want to purchase it, uh, the book is on Amazon in, in, uh, ebook and paperback form. Um, the audio book is going to be out on, out on audible pretty soon. Uh, so just stay tuned for that. And if they want to follow me, it's Instagram, Colby Sharma Official, Facebook, The Curveball 426. And I'm also on LinkedIn at Colby Sharma.